I think that there's an arc of religious practice. And, and one of the things that, that, you know, that I've read about and, and I think maybe I've seen it is that what happens is, is the mainliners used to be what we would probably call the evangelicals of yore. They were the sectarian. These were the people that were, you know, the, the, the Bible, you know, in the 1700s and the 1800s, these people were the Puritans. These people were the people that essentially had what you would call, and I don't mean to sound dismissive of it, the old time religion. And what happens is, is that as institutions and as churches become more successful, they end up basically becoming more secular. Mm -hmm. and they become less religious. And what happens is, is that eventually they, they kind of fade away. Or, or maybe they go back and return to their roots. And I think that this is part of the process that we're seeing uh, in the evangelical community is a kind of a secularization of part of the evangelical community. And one of the things that I saw was is that some of these people, you know, they are reacting to Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth. They, that was the book that they read when they were children. And they realized that that may have been oversimplified. They don't like that stuff either. And or what the whole Left Behind series. Or the whole Left Behind series, movies, which really... They ridicule. In yeah. There. And the thing is, is that the one thing you have to understand is that a lot of these people are looking for a personal faith that allows them to basically fall, make a maze through their, their lives. And they're not looking for a complete uh, narrative uh, that explains everything because they've got questions in their own lives that they need to need addressed. And, and that's what they're, I think, unhappy about. And they, they also look at this stuff and they say, this isn't very sophisticated. This is laughable. And it makes us look like fools to the mm -hmm. greater American public. And we don't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is, is that they say we they look for an alternative. And the, the problem is, is that the alternative uh, is, is, is frankly anti-Israel. Yes, yes. Well, you know, there, there are other issues that we, yeah. we talk about. These things are linked one with the other. Um, right now, uh, this issue of the Middle East is also linked very much to persecution of Christians. Right. And with the whole Arab Spring situation, which we expected, wow, would open up a door of dialogue with the West, and hopefully, right. as they saw, these Western countries like the United States helping and supporting these uh, efforts uh, of oppressed people to gain their rights mm -hmm. to express themselves into democracy, uh, I felt, wow, they will see the goodwill in nations like the United States and uh, you know, France or England trying to support these efforts. And somehow maybe that'll be the opportunity for a dialogue to be established and for, right. for more openness to right. the Western world and so on and so forth. But we've seen the opposite. We've seen that often these uh, efforts have been hijacked or maybe not even hijacked. Maybe they were the origins right from the start of, um, uh, you know, these uh, uh, rebellions against the dictatorships. But now what we see that this supposed uh, democracy has been hijacked and uh, turned into an opportunity for the Islamic, uh, you know, the, the Brotherhood right. uh, or, um, you know, other extremist groups to take over and to try to just ethnically cleanse, you know, the Middle East, as we've seen in Egypt, for example. And so that is a cause of great worry. It's, it's an issue that is often not uh, even mentioned by pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli uh, sectors of, you know, the, the, the huge, this coincidence over and over again where is Islam gains ascendancy, uh, persecution of minorities, including Christians, also at the same time. These are two curves that proceed parallel to each other, and we're seeing that right now. Right. Persecution of Christians all over right. the Middle East, including even even in Palestine itself. I mean, you know, right. in, in the Gaza and the West Bank, there right. is some persecution yeah. as well of Christians. And that's not even that's not being mentioned. I, I think this is one of the things that we have to address: is that the response to the human condition that was offered by Jesus Christ, and the response to the human condition that was offered by Muhammad are two fundamentally different responses. And that doesn't mean that the Christians have always gotten it, okay? We've done terrible acts, but the thing is, is that the good society that descends from a Christian theology and a good society that descends from a Muslim theology are two entirely different societies. And this is something that we really do have to contend with. And we have to understand that ideas have consequences, and theological ideas are the most consequential of all. 
and uh, you know that's not something that, that I can't even remember who I've just plagiarized that from, but I've stolen it. It sounds seven. good, <laughs> and I agree with it 100%. And th this is a reality that, that I think that, that hopefully Christians can become cognizant of uh, without becoming you know, too triumphalist on their, on their own. They have to be able to ma ma you know, maintain their self-criticism and a certain humility and in many instances of self-doubt and to make sure that their politics don't become idolatrous. Okay, and that's a very difficult thing to do. And I, I don't. And we all fall short, and we're going to fall short because that's the human condition again. But when we look at how Muhammad responded to rejection, and this is the the the, the work of Mark Dury. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's written a, a number of books about about Islam and dimitude and its attitudes towards uh, non-Muslims. And after reading his 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 books, I've come to the conclusion that Muslim teachings about non-Muslims represent uh, the great human rights uh, drama of the 21st century, and also Muslim teachings towards women as well. I think Sharia law uh, represents a serious challenge to uh, any humane notions of human rights. I, I don't know how else to put it. And the, 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 the thing is, is that I think it's going to take committed uh, Christians uh, to be able to stand up to that because, frankly, the secularists really haven't been able to respond to that, maybe because they don't think theologically and they don't want to see how theology plays itself out and they don't even want to have to acknowledge that maybe Christianity isn't such the laughable religion that they thought it was. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, uh, this is fascinating. Uh, we could go on. I hope to have you back okay. at some point because right. there's so much good stuff that, that we've just kind of skimmed over, okay. uh, but uh, fascinating stuff. And I think this complex understanding of uh, these issues is what needs to be projected over and over and over again. Because unfortunately, what we have are these uh, overly simplistic, extremist, uh, frankly, I mean, just ignorant, expressions of these viewpoints that need to be rescued and presented in a much more complex way that you represent Charles Jacobs, uh, others. Uh, and I think we need to find ways to bring that out into the open. So, But finishing, I would ask, bring us home to a landing now as we finish this program um, and uh, just share for a couple of minutes, uh, you know, what, what, is the, what is the most important thing that we as Christians need to uh, remember as we approach uh, these issues of uh, Israel and the Palestinians, uh, you know, persecution of uh, Christians in the Middle East, uh, you know, the plight of Africa and so on. You, as a, having gone through that journey, Catholic before liberal Christian and so on, you know, what, 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 is, uh, uh, what is the kind of stance, attitude that we need to take in the light of all these issues? How would you lead us pastorally? Oh, no. into the kind of attitude that we should have and the kind of practice that we could have toward these issues. You know, I guess I would have to offer up an indictment of some of the stuff that I did early on in my career and say don't use the Arab-Israeli conflict as basically a, a, a backdrop to work out some of your own demons. I think that would, and to basically try and look at the conflict for what it is and to respect the humanity of people on both sides of the conflict and also acknowledge their agency and say, look, you know, people have made decisions on both sides of this conflict and, 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 and these decisions have had real consequences. Uh, and at a certain point, you know, if you're going to be a peacemaker, you need to be able to, you know, delineate, uh, you know, the relationship between actions and consequences. And, and ultimately, to try and do that with a certain amount of love and humanity. And, uh, and if you're working out your demons, and I've seen a, a fair number of people on both sides of the debate use this conflict to work out their demons, you're not helping anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess that, that would be it. Yeah, no, no, that, that's very profound. I think your, your whole testimony here throughout the whole course of the entire program has been very illuminating for me. I uh, celebrate your courage, your honesty, your transparency. Thank you for sharing not just the okay. issues, because I think we're tired sometimes of the yeah. issues. And sometimes these kinds of dialogues are more just a rehashing of old arguments back and forth. We love these prefabricated stones at each other. 
and when the dust settles, hearts remain the same. But right. I think personal testimony is really a very moving part of this whole dialogue. So thank you yeah. for that. All right. And I, I celebrate that I'm, I'm enlightened, illuminated by th this conversation. I thank you for the work that you do. Please uh, keep speaking out, uh, keep being humble and right. transparent. It's good that we're still in process. We all are. I all am. Right. I know for sure. And so I thank, I thank the Lord for you. I thank the Lord for this uh, effort to bring truth and, and uh, passion and, and, and spirituality into these issues. I think that's where the hope lies. Thank you so much, right. Dexter thank you. Van Thanks Zyl. For thank you for the work that you do. Thanks. Camera, I think, is doing thank tremendous you. work, and we need to continue. All I right. hope to have you with All us right, again. I'll be so back. I'll be thank back. you to our viewers as well uh, for uh, being with us. I hope that you have been as blessed and moved as I have been throughout this interview. We thank the Lord for you, and I, I, I thank God for rescuing me and for Jesus Christ uh, who... Uh, takes our brokenness and, and uh, works with it and with us uh, with such tenderness and compassion and tolerance. Thank you for being here uh, today and I look forward to being with you again. My name is Roberto Miranda and I bless your life and your family and your ministry until we see each other again. God bless you.